Good afternoon. My name is Michael Collins, and I'm the Director General of the IIEA, the Institute of International and European Affairs here in Dublin. I'm really delighted that so many are joining us today for this very special IIEA event as we mark the 30th anniversary of the foundation of the Institute back in 1991. This afternoon, I have the great honour to extend a very warm welcome indeed to two people, Bertie Hearn and Tony Blair, who as Taoiseach and the British Prime Minister have assured their place in the complex history of these islands. Their great shared legacy is of course the Good Friday Agreement, which underpins the peace that Northern Ireland enjoys today. For six years serving in the Department of the Taoiseach, I worked closely with the Taoiseach and with the Prime Minister and saw at first hand how together they managed the peace process and ultimately also developed in their time on precedent level, unprecedented levels of cooperation, understanding and goodwill between London and Dublin. So we have a lot to talk about, about the past, about the present and particularly also about the future. As usual, we welcome your questions, which you can send to us now or at any, day, at any stage throughout this event using the Q&A function on your screen. And we'll get to as many of these questions as we can in the time available. This event is on the record, and you're also welcome to tweet about this event using the hashtag IIEA30. So let me turn, if I may, before we see the questions come in, let me turn straight away, please, if I may, uh, to you, Tony Blair, uh, and then uh, just to maybe pose a question to you, which I'll also uh, pose uh, to Bertie Ahern. But you and, and, and Bertie Ahern were in office together for some 10 years. And in fact, your, your times in office were absolutely um, in parallel with one another. Uh, you obviously built up a great level of understanding and trust throughout that time. Uh, to what extent was this important in driving uh, the peace process? Well, Michael, first of all, um, thank you very much for inviting me to the IIEA event. And um, let me thank you as well for your enormous contribution to the, the peace process, because I, I remember you well in those years and, and, and how assiduous you were in, in managing what was a very difficult time. And the truth of the matter is, I mean, this, this the Good Friday Agreement and the peace process would never have happened without Bertie Ahern and without his personal involvement, personal commitment, and, and the characteristics he, he brought to the negotiation, which we're always trying to find a way through, uh, preparedness to look forward and not back, to respect our history but not live in it, um, and <clears throat> to negotiate what were extremely and remain extremely difficult things with um, you know, a great amount of, of wisdom and, and intelligence and humor, all of which uh, we needed at many points during this. So yes, it was, it was one thing you learn about politics when you're operating at the highest level is that even if you're at the highest level, it's the very basic human relationships that often matter the most. And um, I think not just with Bertie, but with others in the course of the peace process, the personal relationships and the ability to gain you know, strong elements of trust and understanding were absolutely essential because we were dealing with very, very sensitive issues. And you know, the, the history of British-Irish relations, <laughs> as you know well, are extremely fraught. And for both of us, therefore, we were often addressing different, sometimes diametrically opposite audiences. And that personal relationship was very important in allowing us to do that whilst not losing that trust and confidence. And, you know, I, I honestly, I say this to people um, always when they ask me about my time as prime minister, that I really could not have had a better partner, um, better colleague, and, and ultimately a better friend in that negotiation than Bertie Ahern. Thank you. Just if I could come to you maybe with a similar question, uh, uh, Bertie. Uh, uh, you had to manage obviously the complexity, uh, the complexities of the peace process from this end here. Uh, and it was part of the great strength of the process that the two governments indeed uh, were able to work so closely together. But it can't always be always have been easy to agree. I mean, there were, as, as Tony said, there were many complex, difficult, challenging issues. Uh, and but how would you characterize your relationship with, with the Prime Minister? Well, Michael, it's good to see you and uh, delighted to uh, to join with you uh, today and good luck for all of these events that are around the, the anniversary. Um, I, I think the, the great thing working with, with Tony Blair uh, for me was that I think even in opposition, we had built up a relationship that we trusted each other. 
And both of us had committed in that summer uh, of 1997 that if elected, and his election was a bit more assured of mine because he had an enormous majority, um, I had to work my way through through a, a coalition to get some extra support. But, you know, we, we had decided that we were going to give this thing a real shot. And you, one side couldn't do that. I mean, the, the Irish side could not do that. It was the fact that Tony was prepared had to put in a huge personal commitment to put in enormous hours. I mean, we always think on our side how busy we are. The reality is that, um, you know, the UK is a, is, is a huge country. It, it's huge international involvement. And, you know, to, to get the Prime Minister to dedicate himself uh, to give the hours that he did that winter of 97 into uh, spring of, of 98 uh, to stay uh, at the talks for, for that entire week. And just to be over it every weekend, I, I remember fondly those phone calls uh, to checkers, those phone calls in the car um, to Tony when he was moving around. And, you know, I, I think by the time we got to Good Friday, I remember George Mitchell... And we think of him today. I know he's, he's battling some health issues, but, you know, he, he said, well, that's the end of that bit. Now you have to implement it. And uh, I think Tony and I realized that for, for another nine years, we have to do that. But uh, I think the friendship, I mean, I, mean, I treasured for my life, uh, the rest of my life, the, the friendship we had, um, we had some fun too. Uh, but we worked at EU level closely. We worked internationally closely. But I think for the island of Ireland, the fact that he was prepared uh, to give uh, the commitment, the time, the energy, uh, his enormous skills, uh, that's really what got us across the line. That's excellent. Um, so you know, it's now 23 years since the agreement was uh, was was signed. Uh, 23 years have passed. Um, lots of challenges along the way. Um, there's been successes. There's been disappointments. I suppose there's been frustration. Uh, Tony, I mean, uh, how would you see the state of, uh, of affairs today? I mean, would you have a sense that the the Good, Re Good Friday Agreement has fulfilled all of your expect or some of your many of your expectations? Well, I think the, the, the Good Friday Agreement was, was just a beginning, as, as Bertie was saying a moment ago. And then after that, there, were, there was a long process of implementation. And I would say that, you know, for the nine years following the Good Friday Agreement until when 2007, we finally got the, the executive up and running properly and sustainably. I mean, it was agonizing all the way. And there were constant problems and difficulties, decommissioning, police reform, um, criminal justice reform, the, the thing was, it, it required constant management and focus. And, you know, obviously it's, look, around the world, as I know very well now, people regard the Good Friday Agreement as a, an immense achievement, and it was, but in the end, you know, it takes a long, long time for, you know, old problems and elements of enmity to disappear. And, and I think, you know, we can't, Obviously now we're, we're in a new and difficult situation, um, but you, you can never rest with, with this. And I, I think the one thing that I learned during the course of, of dealing with Northern Ireland over all the time I was prime minister was that, you know, the moment you were, you were complacent, the thing could slip away again. And therefore I think today when you know, as a result, I think principally of, of Brexit, but also of other issues. The, the Northern Ireland situation is back on the agenda. You know, a lot of problems and, and things that we have to sort out. I mean, it just, it just goes to show that, you know, you can't, you've got to keep up the pressure to, to allow those changes to deepen and take root. And it, it's, it's not easy and it will take time. Um, and I think that, um, you know, it's been very frustrating for, for me, obviously, because, you know, I can see over this past period that a, a lot of those tensions have now come back to the surface again and are being debated in ways that are, you know, pretty difficult to resolve, frankly. So, I, I mean, did it look, it, it, it exceeded our expectations in the sense that you know, it, it worked as an agreement. We managed at least for a considerable period of time to get um, a reasonably stable government. In Northern Ireland, it worked to that degree, but there was always, even without the recent problems, there was always going to be a lot more to do. And now, really, as in a, as a result of Brexit and 
all the issues over the Northern Ireland Protocol, we now have a lot more to do in order to make sure that its, it's safety is guaranteed. And would you see uh, Bertie's safety being threatened uh, currently? Um, and how, I mean, how, what's your, your, your sense of the agreement after these 23 years? Has it met your expectations? I know there are a lot more work to be done, I'm sure, but um, I mean, it, does, does, it, does, it, does, it, does it cause a level of frustration with you? And maybe just also, if I may, Bertie, to what extent um, do you, would you have a concern that the current generation, if I may call them that, you know, maybe uh, has uh, maybe a less of a full appraisal of what it took to bring about the peace that was secured in the 1990s. Yeah, I, I think the probably the great success uh, of the agreement um, in the early years is that it, it ended uh, violence. I mean, there has been some events, but you know, thankfully not much. There's been some protests, but again, um, not much. And I think that that has been the very successful part. Uh, have we still got peace walls? Have we still got differences? Um, uh, we still got antagonism and sometimes uh, just um, raw hatred um, uh, and unfortunately some of those things that I would have hoped would have drifted away uh, over a decade or two uh, have not done so. Um, uh, as I always say, Michael, the, the one thing that Tony and I were always talking about was the process and it was a process, it was an ongoing process uh, and that this would live on probably for many, many decades after us. The one thing we never talked about was um, what would happen if the UK or Ireland uh, left the European Union. Um, I think we spoke about everything else from May to Z and back and up and down, but we never thought of that. And quite frankly, that has that has created the, the real tensions of the last few years. And, you know, without getting into it blow by blow, we, we thought that, you know, that, that we were through that. We thought the protocol uh, had got the UK into the tunnel, which ultimately led to the full withdrawal agreement. Uh, and then even this very day, as, as we speak, um, uh, Lord David Frost is, is, is indicating that, that, that he doesn't see the protocol being part of the UK policy going forward. So, you know, this is a real tension. And unfortunately, that then uh, creates the position that the politicians believe that in some way or another they can move this aside and you know <laughs> that can't ignore the fact of what will EU leaders will say this is the integrity of the single market so things now that are outside of what Tony and I negotiated uh, start taking over and I think that's going to be the problem for the immediate months ahead. Yeah and, and, and Tony I mean 23 years later I mean you've got um, to some extent a new generation of uh, politicians in Britain many of whom basically weren't around for uh, for the troubles indeed and indeed for the uh, what, what, what you achieved in the 1990s in particular. I mean is there a, is there maybe um, a lack of full appreciation of the dimensions of what it took to bring about that uh, that agreement and, and, and what it still takes to protect it? Yes I think there is I mean I think the problem is number one a lot of people don't remember what the troubles were really like, uh, you know, when our new schedules would be dominated often many days of a week um, by, um, you know, terrible tragedies and acts of violence uh, in Northern Ireland. I mean, it was a very, very difficult situation for years and years and years. And so, yes, I think people, that's now a distant memory for people. And, I do think there's always a risk when you when you create a, a peace agreement, you settle everything down, the situation's calmer, and, and the risk always is, I think this was less with us because we had negotiated the original agreement and therefore we're, we're constantly on the watch to make sure that it was sustained. But I think there is a risk that politicians got to take the Good Friday Agreement for granted um, and thought, well, this is just the way of things. And the truth is there are still issues that you need to resolve. And then of course, this whole new dimension as a result of Brexit and the Northern Ireland Protocol has, has created a, a, you know, additional real problems. And I think um, it, it's also meant that some of the issues that we weren't able to deal with, because you know, there's still segregation in, in uh, Northern Ireland. We still have a situation where I think fewer than 10% of the children go to mixed schools. So you've still got a lot of, of, of social and economic issues that have, have got to be reckoned with. And the trouble is, you know, those, those issues are always potentially going to rise to the surface and cause real problems when they then get linked with, with the issues that are around 
you know, the constitutional questions. And look, the problem very simply with the, 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 the protocol now is that, you know, it's an inevitable consequence of the fact that um, the UK voted to leave Europe we took Britain out of the single market and the customs union. And then because the external border of the European Union then became the border between North and South and Ireland, it was always gonna be a huge problem. And there was never any way out of that. And so that's the reason why this, the protocol was negotiated and it's, it's extremely difficult. Um, and so you, you've got some of these some of these long-standing issues, social, economic, um, uh, you know, the context of, of, of the conflict that is elements of the conflict that's still there. And then you've got this, this new edition um, of, of a constitutional challenge that the Brexit situation brings about. So I think, you know, what, what I constantly urge the government today is to realize that if you, if you want to protect the Good Friday Agreement, you've got to work at it hard. You, you've got to be prepared to really devote time to it. And you know, with the best will in the world, that can't just be left to the Secretary of State. It's also got to engage the interest and attention of the Prime Minister and the whole of the government. Because otherwise, you know, what, what we have built up with a, a lot of hard work and effort is going to be at risk. Yeah, I, I think we'll come back to, if we may, uh, to the protocol issue and maybe issues around Brexit a little bit more uh, later on. But uh, I see there's an early question in, in around um, uh, one of those unresolved issues, which is, uh, if I may put it to you, uh, Bertie, the, uh, legacy issues. Again, most recently manifest, I suppose, in the uh, in the um, in the coroner's report on the Valley Murphy killings back in 1971. So, indeed, some of the issues, many issues, several issues, were not resolved on the day in 1997. Some of them have been resolved since. But a question from John Cushnahan, a former leader of the uh, um, the Alliance Party and MEP: How do both speakers believe the legacy issues should be addressed? So, Bertie, could I put that one to you first? Well, I mean, I think from the day we negotiated the Good Friday Agreement, we've been trying to deal with uh, the legacy issues. And uh, there were a, a number of events that happened early, early on. Um, Tony uh, agrees that we would deal with the Bloody Sunday issue. And we had a, a long, detailed inquiry that was successfully concluded in so far as, as I think the relatives uh, appreciated that um, it didn't bring back anybody uh, that was killed, we know that, and it, it didn't solve all the problems of those who were injured, but I think it was a, a, a decent, genuine attempt to deal with it. Uh, then we looked at some of the other cases and we made some progress on that. And then after our time, the, the, the governments and the parties in the North agreed to Storm and House uh, Agreement back in seven years ago. Now, I, I accept that if the Storm and House Agreement was as perfect uh, as everybody genuinely tried to make it uh, at the time, then it probably would have been implemented now. Uh, the fact is it isn't. But the, the way to resolve that, Michael, is for the, the governments uh, and the parties uh, to, to sit down and see where it's not working and see what changes that they, they have to make. And there's a lot being written in recent days about that. But I, I think it, 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 the Stormont House Agreement is fairly good. Um, it, it Maybe it's some... Uh, nuancing that that is required uh, to deal with it, but um, the uh, at the same time, as you recall, Mike, we I, I put a lot of time into the Dublin Manahan bombings, uh, some of the other bombings that took place in border towns. Nobody was prosecuted on that, but we had two eminent chief justices or uh, Supreme Court judges, Justice Hamilton, and um, who spent many years on it, then followed on a, a, again. Uh, so. Uh, there was a lot of work done on that. I don't think that can be done for every single case. Uh, I don't think you can take 40,000 cases and deal with them all to the same extent. Uh, so there has to be a process of dealing with that. Uh, and, and that has to be worked out in the Storm and House Agreement. And, you know, one of the things, just to quickly add, like what Tony was saying, it, I, I'm delighted to see that the two governments had a meeting the other day, but more importantly, that there is a British-Irish Intergovernmental Conference the reason Tony and I put that into the agreement 
was that the kind of partnership and connectivity between the two governments that we had established for a decade would continue on. And, you know, there hasn't been a, a British Irish Intergovernmental Conference uh, in the life of uh, either the government here or the, or the British, uh, of this British government. So I think these issues need to be sorted out. And when they have their meeting, which we've been pushing to for some time, I, I understand it's in June, but they need to look at these issues and not ignore them and, and, and not let them drift any further. And Tony, do you think there's room for, I mean, it wasn't done at the time, but there was a lot of talk about it, some sort of a retreat, retrieval, like, like, the, like in South Africa, in terms of dealing with legacy issues, issues from the past. Uh, would anything have been achieved by that? And, and maybe why, why, why didn't we do something like uh, the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission? Well, I think it's, it's, it, it's worth exploring all of these options because people, you know, you, you, you're, trying to, you, you're trying to deal with two um, problematic and sometimes conflicting emotions. One is to try and put the past behind us, but the other is to understand the, the suffering and the heartache that people have gone through and, and their desire to know the truth about what happened. And, you know, we, you know, we did try and resolve this when we were in office and, and you know, frankly, we found it impossible to do it. And the Stormont House Agreement was an a, a attempt to, to do it also. And so I think you've got to keep searching for this um, because although in one sense, it's, it's very easy to say, well, you know, look, just let's put the past behind us and move on. It, for, for a lot of the, the families who were, and so many were, who were touched by the troubles and, and lost the ones that they love and in circumstances where they don't know what happened to them. You know, this is, this, this pain I think never goes away. And one of the reasons, look, I remember when we set up the Bloody Sunday Inquiry and you know, I had a lot of internal opposition to it, a lot of internal opposition. And I have to say, as it was going on, I was, you know, at times worried about how it would come out and, and how we would handle it. But in the end, it, it, it actually did serve its purpose because it, 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 uh, it allowed people to, to find out the truth of what happened. And that is, you know, that is an important part of allowing people to grieve in the right way. So I don't, I mean, I think there's no easy answers to this and I don't want to cause any more difficulty for the government than, the, than what they're in already. But I would just stress this, the, the thing that Bertie just said a moment or two ago, the British Irish Intergovernmental Conference was an important element of the agreement. And honestly, all of these issues are easier dealt with if the British and Irish governments are working closely together. I mean, I, I can say throughout the whole of that, the, the 10 years of my premiership, the ability to have that close relationship with my Irish counterpart and, and our two governments to be pretty knitted together when trying to deal with issues of immense sensitivity. It was an enormous protection for us and, and an enabler to find solutions. So I think I, I'm, if, if this conference is coming up soon, I think it, it can't happen soon enough. And I think it's, it's in that context, you're able often to find solutions to these problems. There was just a question here from uh, Daniel Murray, who uh, was from the Business Post, um, an Irish uh, weekend newspaper. Um, and maybe to you first, Bertie, he says, as a result of Brexit, do we need to rethink elements of the Good Friday Agreement or create a new agreement uh, on the politics of a shared island post-Brexit uh, in the process of reaffirming the Good Friday Agreement for a new generation? So I suppose the issue is, and there has been a little bit of chatter, uh, not at governmental level, but there has been a little bit of chatter uh, around, I suppose, about whether... Uh, the, the, uh, the, the agreement is, is there for all time in the shape and form that it was negotiated in 98, or is there capacity to, uh, uh, to look at that, or is that a good idea even? No, with, with Tony and I had never any problem about that, Michael, as you well recall. In, in 98, um, when the agreement was ratified, uh, we put a review clause into it. Uh, and after the 2003 election, uh, where uh, the DUP and Sinn Féin came to prominence. Uh, then we started engaging uh, with, with the Sinn Féin uh, leadership and the DUP leadership, which led to the two October 2006 agreement in St. Andrews. Uh, and that was a review. 
Uh, and that was difficult negotiations as well, and that allowed us to continue one of the institutions to uh, be formed in, in May 2007. So um, there's never any problem uh, in, in, in looking at to see where we can nuance it. Um, the idea of, of, of negotiating or changing it uh, would be lunacy. Um, all you need to do is to uh, tweak it wherever you need to, 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 to tweak it. I sometimes worry, and I'm not saying it about Daniel, but I sometimes worry that some of the things I hear about the, um, the agreement that would really be good for some of the, the current population to read the full agreement because uh, they make comments uh, about things that are actually in the agreement. So, um, but I, I, I have no problem about people looking from time to time uh, and seeing um, if there are things that we can go. But I, I really do feel, Michael, that since 1997, uh, the biggest issue that we faced, and we faced lots of issues, I really do think it's, it, it's Brexit because um, it's creating problems within political parties, it's creating problems within loyalism, within unionism, it's creating tensions uh, economically wise. And uh, really a handle on this has to be uh, got onto very quickly because uh, the, if we just keep on shouting across the water at each other, uh, it's not helping. And just to have, I see a question here from Bobby McDonough, a former colleague, of course, and well known to you, Bertie, and perhaps to you, um, uh, Tony, as well. But what Bobby uh, says, um, Brexit represents a lurch towards uh, unilateralism and, quote, taking back control. How dangerous is unilateralism for Northern Ireland and more globally? Uh, Tony? Um, yeah, well, it's, look, the, my view is that the world we live in requires countries to to cooperate and 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 you do that not because not because you want to diminish your own national interest but because you believe that cooperation enhances it so um look as you know i was strongly uh, opposed to to brexit um it's happened it's there um i think with goodwill and some trust it, it is possible to find a way through and the problems caused by the uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol in the in the Brexit agreement, but the trouble is, you know, that trust and goodwill is in pretty short supply between um, the UK and Europe. I, I mean, I've had this these conversations also with the the current Taoiseach, and you know, my institute published a quite a good paper just a short time ago suggesting how we might better bridge the the gaps between the sides, but. You know, the origins of the problem are just very, very simple. Inevitably, there was going to be a problem um, along the border. And so the, the, for, for the European Union, of course, it's got to protect the integrity of the single market. Um, if the, we want to keep the border open, that means naturally a, a different relationship between Northern Ireland and Europe than the one between Britain and, and Europe so far as aspects of trade are concerned. So I think that it is possible to find a way through, but it will require us to, to cooperate and work strongly together. And you know, one thing I think, the spirit with which you approach that, and this is really goes to the point about unilateralism. You know, we would never have had the Good Friday Agreement if I played to my audience simply and Bertie had played to his audience simply. So one of the, the real challenges of leadership is the degree to which you're prepared ultimately to say to some of your own people and your own supporters, look, this is worth spending political capital on. And even though there may be an easy and popular solution, we're not taking it. And the Good Friday Agreement, not just myself and Bertie, but, you know, all of those people who are involved in negotiating that and agreeing it, all of them at some point in order to make this work, had to, to be prepared to spend their political capital and be prepared to say, look, in the interests of cooperation, because we have a, a desire to reach agreement, we're prepared to make compromise and concession. And you know, that is the spirit in which this has got to be approached now. And so if, if we approach it as, as the UK in just trying to play to those people who, who, who are strongly pro-Brexit, 
you know, we'll make a big mistake. We've got to, to try and search for a way through and be prepared to do that, not in the spirit of unilateralism, but in the spirit of common and shared interests and values. Yeah, um, uh, uh, Bertie, if I could just come come back to you, if I may, um, in relation to a question here from somebody who's well known to both of you, uh, your former uh, press uh, secretary, Mandy Johnson, has a question in um, asking you no less, uh, what would each of you do uh, to resolve the current situation if you were in office? Uh, obviously, you have the, the privilege or the, 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 the fact is you're not in office. We appreciate that. But if you were in office today, confronted with, you know, uh, the doubts that, that, that uh, the, the, um, the, the issues in around the protocol, uh, I suppose the, uh, the the absence of the reconciliation that you would have hoped for arising from the Good Friday Agreement. If you were in office today, uh, Bertie S. Taoiseach, um, is there any first step that you would make uh, to try and ease the situation and to bring it to bring about um, a sort of a, a return uh, to greater tranquility? Well, I think there are two things. One directly on the the British and the the Irish position, uh, the Intergovernmental Council is is the obvious way, and and trying to build up you know, trust and confidence and solidarity uh, between the teams. And it's, it's not necessary for the, you know, the Taoiseach or the Prime Minister to be meeting every month, but, you know, of terms of quarters they can meet, ministers can meet. So that was the idea, that, that's how it was framed. And I think that will help. On the protocol, it's a bit more difficult because uh, it's not our call. We, we have to, we, we just feed in uh, to, the, to the European um system and working with with other countries and that's not easy and uh, i i know the uh simon coveney has been doing that as as foreign minister uh very well but uh there, there are difficulties because sometimes maybe there are things we would compromise on but europe won't compromise on but i i, I think you can just try and, and try to, to to bring things around but um as i understand it uh, michael i might be wrong on this but uh, it, it looks as if, um, and I don't want to throw more oil on the, on the fire, but it looks as if David Foss is, is more or less saying uh, the way that Europe are trying to operate the protocol um, is very fine, but that the UK are not going to play that game. And that's what's in this letter of today, if, if the news reports are correct on it. Now, it, it, that will give the inevitable response from Europe, I'm sure. Um, and I don't want to spell out what I think that would be, but it's fairly obvious. Um, so, so therefore... They, 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 this they, this uh, horse is running away from us, uh, and I think the the I think Ireland and, and Britain need to try and work on that, and we have to work through the EU. But it, it, it's not good, and we're at the start of the March and season. We're enough attentions, we're enough of problems, um, and really it requires uh, hands-on, dedicated. I know we're in the middle of a pandemic, and we, I know we've all the other difficulties, but this needs some careful handling on on all sides. Tony, if I could put the same question to you, I mean, I don't suppose uh, Boris Johnson is calling you looking for advice on, on, on Northern Ireland, but if you were to do so, um, is there any a singular piece of advice that you would offer him at this stage to, to, to calm things a little bit? Yeah, but I mean, I think the, the advice I would give him is to try and, and, and break the, the, the operation of the protocol down into the practical parts of it, because it's all about the goods that move from, um, from Great Britain to Northern Ireland and then Northern Ireland potentially um, in, uh, down into the south. So you've got to look at you've got to look at the actual facts of what is happening. Try and work out where, for example, um, you know there may well be cases where it's it's very obvious the rules will carry on being aligned. So you you you, you know you, you you may be able to deal with some of these issues in a consensual way. But I think the other thing that I'd say is, you know, sometimes. It's one of the things I think we learned with the, the operation of the Good Friday Agreement, as I say, because this was, we, we made that agreement, but then there was a whole series of other things that had to be agreed after it. And sometimes what you need to do is you just need to keep, keep going at talking through all the different issues and doing it really not, um, not by public megaphone, because that only inflames the situation, but doing it in a way which allows you then to, to try and, as you, as you discussed with the Irish government, the European Union, allows you to see where you might, you know, you might be able to remove obstacles, uh, ease the path towards doing things. Because, you know, the Northern Ireland Protocol, I mean, it was negotiated 
by the same people who are now questioning it. So it's it's not as this was not an inherited agreement. This was an agreement that was signed and entered into by the very people now talking about it. So I, I think you know it's 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 going to be very difficult if if uh, the UK simply says it wants to cast it aside. That's going to be extremely difficult to do because you know. It's not as if the issues at the heart of it weren't absolutely obvious at the time that it was negotiated. I mean, they were absolutely obvious. That's why some of us were saying, well, there's going to be a problem here. So mm -hmm. I think in those circumstances, my, my advice would be, you know, and I think this has, it, it will take the involvement and engagement of the prime minister ultimately, is that you've got to approach this in a way which tries, as I say, to disaggregate, disaggregate all the issues find out where there may be common ground and work out some practical solutions because otherwise you'll end up in a situation where there is a, a complete breakdown and then all of those anxieties that there are um, about the protocol and the way it operates are just going to deepen and then the thing will become even more difficult to resolve. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it is possible to resolve it, by the way, having looked at it in some detail myself, um, I think there are areas where it's obvious there's going to be a common interest in preserving common rules, but it requires a lot of patience, a lot of hard work, a lot of goodwill, and a lot of trust. And as I say, those, those latter two uh, things are in short supply right now. We should stop against the talk a little bit here. So I'm just going to come to uh, one or two questions. There was a, a question here from Harry McGee from the Irish Times. If the UK government, uh, uh, Tony, in a unilateral mood were to scrap the Northern Ireland Protocol in its entirety, where would that leave the situation a uh, seamless border between North and South? Uh, and uh, Bertie as well. And then I just want to come to one final question, if I may, in relation to a border poll, of which we've many uh, questions come in. But maybe, uh, 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 Tony, first you on the... Uh, on, on the question of, of if, the uni, if the UK government were to unilaterally scrap the protocol, is that even an option? Well, I don't, I don't see how, the, how we can do that. I mean, we, we entered into an agreement. Um, so I think that would be, I mean, that would get an extremely negative reaction. Yeah. I, I, I think it, it would be a, a big mistake to do that. I think what, what the government's got to do is it's got to try and work out some practical solutions to it. I think they are there to be grasped if we really want to. And I think that's best done without trying to put some sort of public pressure on the EU, because that's only going to make the EU come out with, a, with an even stronger defense of its own position. So I, I, no, I think this, this, is, this has got to be done by patient negotiation, you know, the British government, the Irish government, the EU, in theory, everyone wants the same thing, which is that you're, you're able to come together and make a proper agreement to keep the border open and to allow the protocol to function. So I think that's the best thing for them to concentrate upon. Okay, uh, Bertie, just to come to you, if, if I may, um, um, unless you want to come back in on that, the, 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 the protocol issue and the idea of a, of a unilateral abandonment of it. But I just want to come because we've many, many questions of all the issues. The most uh, we, 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 we've questions on is, is on the question of a border poll. And, um, and I, we're drawing up against the clock here. So I just want to uh, just maybe ask the question. I did see one in from Dermot O'Leary from Good Bodies, for example, stockbrokers in relation to this, but there's many others as well. Uh, Bertie, you first, and uh, then uh, then Tony, and we're going to really have to wrap up on this particular uh, question. But it's the, I suppose, it's the question of the day. Um, uh, you know, uh, under what circumstances should there be a referendum uh, on Irish unity? Uh, and uh, do you think Tony would the UK government facilitate this? But starting with you first, uh, uh, obviously it's very topical here. It's become topical here. Uh, so is this in prospect, um, uh, uh, Bertie? Well, listen, it's going to be a, a big issue and it's going to continue on being a big issue. And back when we had the 20th anniversary uh, of the Good Friday Agreement at, at Queen's, when, when Tony was there and Bill Clinton was there, George Mitchell, uh, I said at that stage, I, we had made provision for it uh, in the agreement. It was clear that someday we would have it and that was spelled out. But I said then, and I say the same today, uh, there are three conditions as I, I see it. One, that the institutions have to be working and working satisfactory. And um, at that stage, they weren't. They were up and running for the last 
18 months or so, but they must continue to run before you could get into, into that uh, space. Uh, the second one, you have to do the planning. Uh, there is not a lot of planning done. There are various academic groups and others now uh, doing that, and I think that will help. And the third thing, I think there has to be um, some persuasion of at least uh, a, a reasonably large proportion uh, of the unionist community that they see this is the way going forward. The idea of having a sectarian headcount or having us or them uh, or, or just uh, pitching one side against the other uh, is not the way to go. Uh, so my summary of that, Michael, is we're, we're some years away from it. I hope it does happen, uh, but it has to be done carefully and in time. Okay, Tony, I'll leave the last word on that to you. Yeah, well, I think there's a wise words from 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 Bertie of, of caution in this, particularly at the present time. I mean, look, there's a, there's provision set out in the Good Friday Agreement as to how this 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 can happen based on assessments of public opinion. But you know, in the end, I think this is look, Brexit's put the issue back on the agenda in Scotland. Uh, it, no doubt's put it back on the agenda in in Northern Ireland. Um, but I think we've got to proceed with a, a, a lot of a lot of caution and according to the terms we've set out in the Good Friday Agreement. And probably right now, um, it's it's not very auspicious to uh, to put it high on the agenda. Let's get out. Let's get the problems we've got now with the executive, the Northern Ireland Protocol, and everything sorted out. Okay. So look, I mean, we've come to the end of this part of our webinar, and I think we've seen something quite special um, in these uh, exchanges. And also got a sense of the capacity and the potential for these islands and particularly for Northern Ireland when London uh, and Dublin work in close harmony with one another uh, which was very much a feature of when uh, Bertie Hearn was Taoiseach and uh, Tony Blair was Prime Minister. So on my own behalf, on behalf of the IA, I want to thank you both uh, sincerely. We could go on for the whole afternoon. Uh, we were only really scratching the surface and we always knew we'd only get so far uh, but I think we got an idea of, 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 of really the, uh, your, your views on current issues and obviously the sincerity with which you hold these views as well. So we very much appreciate it. But before we, we adjourn this event, I do, however, now want to turn to, uh, to you, uh, uh, to introduce to you, Tony and, and Bertie, the winner of the IIEA, Brendan Halligan uh, Emergency, uh, Emerging Scholar Essay Competition, uh, the winner of which uh, we announced yesterday, and she is Lisa Clare Whitten, who is a PhD student in Queen's University, Belfast. Uh, whose essay on Ireland, Europe and Northern Ireland was chosen by a panel of independent judges. Uh, and uh, we're very, very pleased that Lisa, uh, Lisa, Lisa is with us. But before I hand over to Lisa, I just know that uh, the Tony and, uh, and you first, uh, uh, Bertie, maybe would like to offer your congratulations to Lisa Clare. Yeah, yeah Lisa. sorry. Go ahead, Tony, go yeah. ahead. Lisa, well done. That's, uh, and, and I, I'm, I'm looking forward to reading it uh, this weekend. Um, should offer me some interesting clues on the conversation we've just been having. But well done, that's a great achievement. Thank you. Like, you know, Tony, we, we limited the competition to 1500 words. So I'm sure Lisa Clare could have written more extensively, but you get an idea of the quality of the work from, from within the 1500 words. So, so Bertie, just uh, maybe just a word from you before we hand over to Lisa Clare. Yeah, Lisa Clare, my warmest congratulations to you and when well done uh, to win a, uh, an essay competition called after uh, the great Brendan Halligan, who I knew so well. Um, it's a, gr a great uh, tribute to you and, and a great honour as well. So, and, and congratulations as well. You, you told me earlier on that you managed to get your uh, PAC thesis in as well. So um, yes, congratulations and uh, I hope you can enjoy the summer ahead. Okay, well, thank you both. So listen, I wanted, Lisa, uh, Claire, I want to bring you in now, if I may. And first of all, again, to congratulate you on behalf of everybody at the Institute. I was at the the final adjudication panel. I can tell you, it was it was pretty uh, pretty uh, demanding stuff. The expectations that they had, and obviously you won out in the end of the day. So, and now uh, maybe I'd just like to bring you in, if I, if I could, maybe to talk about your essay and and its, its central theme. Of course. Um, thank you, Michael and Prime Minister Blair and Taoiseach O'Hearn for your kind words, and thank you to everyone at IIEA for extending the great honour of being the first recipient of the Brendan Halligan Emerging Scholar Essay Award. It truly is a privilege to be associated in this small way with the work and legacy of Brendan Halligan. I believe Taoiseach Martin in his address yesterday described him as a guiding light, which I thought a powerful and fitting metaphor. 
I was asked to say some, to make some brief remarks about the essay I submitted. But if I may, I first wanted to just say something as a direct beneficiary of the piece so far discussed at today's event. As mentioned, I'm currently based at Queen's University in Belfast and zooming into you today from Northern Ireland where I was born and raised. I have some very early childhood memories of army checkpoints and bomb scares, but the vast majority of my life has been lived in post agreement Northern Ireland. This being so, and given it's very rare, I would have the opportunity to do so. I wanted to put on record, um, virtual record, my heartfelt thanks to Prime Minister Tony Blair and Taoiseach Bertie Hearn for their efforts towards and dedication to the pursuit of peace and reconciliation in Northern Ireland. I'm one of the 1.9 plus million uh, people whose lives have been better as a result. Turning to the essay, as mentioned, its content and argument was based on a comparison between the peripheral status of Northern Ireland in the accession process of the UK and Ireland to the EEC, which became the EU, and its pivotal status in the process of UK's withdrawal from the EU, Brexit. When the UK and Ireland joined the European Integration Project together, Northern Ireland was in a state of severe political instability. As the legislative and constitutional processes necessary to formalise accession took place in the two states in 1972, the people of Northern Ireland endured one of the worst years of violence and political turmoil of the Troubles. Yet the worsening crisis here had no noticeable effect on the parallel processes of British and Irish accession. Fast forward 47 years and as we all know, Northern Ireland played a starring role in the Brexit process. Arrangements eventually agreed by Prime Minister Johnson in the Ireland, Northern Ireland Protocol substantially differentiate Northern Ireland from the rest of the UK through so generous provisions that established Northern Ireland as a new frontier in EU external relations and further reinforce its particularity as a region of the UK and as a sub-state entity with an exceptional relationship with its nearest neighbour, Ireland. The essay reflects on what that the stark contrast between the status of the Northern Ireland problem in 1972 and again in 2020 can tell us about the project of European integration generally. I shall leave those points um, for anyone interested enough to read at a later date. But in setting out that contrast, the essay discussion implicitly begs the question as to what the status of Northern Ireland is and will be in the post Brexit era. I don't have an answer. But I would suggest that this is the most important question to be addressed in any discussions of peace and its future on the island of Ireland and between these islands. The challenges facing post-Brexit Northern Ireland are considerable. The peace here is fragile and it is incomplete. However, the fact that the starting point for the conversation this afternoon was how that peace can be preserved and how it can be improved is still, I would argue, reason for us to hope that the difficult issues of today can be overcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa Clare, and um, uh, thank you, Tony, indeed, and thank you, uh, Bertie. We're going to draw proceedings to an end here. Thank you, indeed, uh, Lisa Clare, for sharing that. Plenty of room for food for thought there, and uh, we look forward to putting it on our website very shortly. Um, with that, I want to draw proceedings to an end uh, to thank the Taoiseach, our former Taoiseach, former Prime Minister, uh, very, very much. Uh, our events in the IAEA will be continuing in the afternoon. We have another event at two, uh, 3.30, uh, dedicated to Northern Ireland, chaired by Daryl MacDonald. You're all welcome to stay, those of you who are joining us. But the rest, uh, Taoiseach, uh, Bertie Ahern, former Taoiseach, uh, Lisa Clare, uh, Prime Minister Blair, uh, thank you very much indeed. That was really, really important that we should have had this conversation and, um, and, and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much indeed.